Welcome to uh, Sonic Talk number 298. I've actually got the lower third right this week. Um, good to see those people in the chat room, live chat room, of course. Uh, sonicstate.com forward slash live, 4 p.m. every Wednesday uh, when we do the show. This is, in fact, going to be the last show, certainly for a week. I, I may be able to uh, manage one when I get back from NAM. usually do. Uh, it's, of course, NAM week. What can I say? The last one before now. Next week, we'll be in California doing our thing. If you want to watch us, of course, you'll be able to uh, enjoy us on the Personas live video stream. So if you head over to personas.com around uh, 9.30, 9.45 uh, Pacific time, um, you should see me and Rich um, talking rubbish for 15 minutes every day about the about the show. In fact, no, actually, that's I, I, I'm, I'm underselling it. Uh, we've been uh, asked to do a little bit of editorial whereby we'll be on their show stand doing a live sort of roundup, playing a few bits of exclusive footage that we're going to spin in via there because they've got a full they've got a setup like this in a booth, basically. And um, so we're going to uh, be part of that. And uh, they're very kindly sponsoring our video coverage and means you might see some of our videos uh, on their live stream as well because we're giving them access to those. So uh, once again, I want to thank Personas, um, big, big style for uh, sorting us out for NAM, And uh, hopefully um, we'll have a lot of fun there. But um, we'll say hello. Uh, uh, yes, you, before I go, um, uh, this week I am wide, Nick. I've put on a lot of weight over Christmas, but it only just happened in the last three days. No, it's the aspect ratio has gone a bit wrong. Um, so next time you see me, hopefully I'll be a lot thinner. You mean um, the aspect ratio is now working properly? <laughs> <laughs> Curse you, Gaz Williams. You've <laughs> sussed me out. I suppose that's as good a time as any to introduce you. Gaz Williams, go at Goldstar on Twitter, songsurgeon.co.uk. Blurry bass player in his attic in um, in, oh, in Bristol. His, uh, his video is a little bit challenged, but we oh. can still make him out. Oh. How are you, Gaz? I, yeah. I'm sensing you're in high spirits. Well, I wired in. I wired in the system as well, especially, and it's still blurry. That's not fair. Or maybe it... Maybe this is just how I look these days. So you're yeah. fading away. It's like Dorian Gray. You are in the attic. <laughs> so somewhere there's a high-resolution photograph of you getting more and more high-res. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, having a good day today. So Good. Hope. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Uh, Gaz Williams, of course, I have said. Bass player, producer, mastering engineer, um, co-producer of Sonic Touch, which has been doing extremely well the last couple of episodes. So we're going to have to try and get that. I was hoping we were going to get another one shot on Friday this week, but unfortunately um, our date has uh, had technological problems and can't demonstrate what they were hoping to demonstrate because there just isn't enough juice in the hardware they've been provided with. I will not say any more because that would be unfair. But hopefully when we get back, we'll be able to see that. Um, so, Gaz, thank you very much for joining us, definitely. And, um, oh, I'm peeking a bit there. We'll also say hello to Mr. David Spears of G4Software.com. Dave is, uh, is, in, a is there place. in a different place. Yeah, that's right. At home. You, you chucked a sickie today. Uh, no, not really. Well, no, no, no. My ear's been playing up for a couple of days, so I didn't go into the studio today, but that also coincided with the car needing a cam belt. So there you Ooh, go. That's a big job, that. Yeah, I know. They all kind of go, when you, when you take it in for a, a cam belt and an oil change. But it's one of those things, if you don't do it and the cam belt goes, your engine blows up. So you've got to get it done, folks. In fact, this would be a good time to have a Campbell ad, wouldn't it? <laughs> Only we haven't got one. <laughs> oh, dear. But Dave Spears, uh, G4 Software, makers of fine um, software instruments, um, Reason, uh, rack extensions and the like. Um, not going to NAM this week, right? Uh, next week, right? No, which is a shame because Iris got the got a EM award. So it was kind of like, oh, you could come out and collect an award, or and then, I, but no, no, we're kind of, we are very, very busy, so I'm not going to do it. That's very big of you, Dave. But thank you for doing this. Anyway, see how I did there? That was a beautiful link. Fantastic. Fantastic, wasn't it? And of course, we have Mr. Mark Tinley over there, uh, likebeing.com, um, uh, music technologist, sound artist, general uh, thoughtful chap with uh, love 
behind him at all times. <laughs> at, least, at least when he's in that room. Back on the. I got some business cards printed the other day that say "music technologist" across them. I can't show you because they're upstairs, but uh, oh. I got them from Vistaprint for two pounds sixty-eight. Nice. Bit of a bargain. No, we're doing all that sort of thing at the moment. We've got the. Um, I've got T-shirts on order for the for the amped guys. We've got two guys going out there to cover the guitar stuff. They're going to have a little logo on the front. And more importantly, you write on the back, Sonic State Amped. <laughs> so when you're walking away and everybody goes, who was that? They just go yeah. and, and people can chase up to you and go, hold on a minute. I, I want you to look at this brand new Plectrum design or whatever it is. You know, that's we find that stuff very effective, actually, at trade shows. So we're uh, but it's very disappointing because I've gone in and I bought them. They fit small and medium T-shirts. I, I just it's just really well, get of... them printed in America. If you're going to America, get them done out there and pick them up out there from somewhere. They'll, then they'll do X X X X L. I don't <laughs> I don't want X X X L because four X's mark before you get Nick. Yeah. <laughs> well, they did, maybe they did, they do the th- you know fourteen nine stroke three four whichever way round that's gone the wrong way aspect ratio uh, special design t shirt. I think yeah, they I could get a t shirt with uh, uh, the aspects ratio. I'm not fat. It's my aspect ratio is wrong. Something like that. Actually, what would be really funny would be to. We're really going off on a bit of a red herring here. Why ever not? We're talking about music terminology, but you could take the uh, you could take the lettering. I'm not fat, and then you could change the aspect ratio of it so it was actually the wrong way round, which would make you look fat. And then you could print that on a t-shirt with the wrong aspect ratio. Wow! Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Should we stop? Before yeah, we can? I, I, I can't really ah! take. I can't really I must, take it. Can I tell you about TV mania music as well before I forget? I'll go on then. About. Uh, 17 years ago, I think, maybe a little bit more, I recorded an album with Nick Rhodes and Warren Cucurullo called TV Mania, and it's being released on March the 11th after 17 years. Nick found the tapes and went, oh, actually, this was quite good. I think we should put this out, (laughs) uh, which is rather nice because I keep seeing my name popping up all over the place, so um, I'm rather pleased about that. Excellent. Does that mean you're going to get some some late, late royalties then? Only if people buy it. Ah. And if it, if it. If it goes anything like my Christmas song, then um, uh, I might be able to buy a box of tea bags or something with the royalties. <laughs> anyway, I, we're getting flack in the John Van Eaton oh, in the chat room is saying, get on, get on, start talking about the NAM rumours. So, yes, we're going to do that. Uh, we've got a sort of, there are a few categories, really. I mean, one being um, stuff we know about, uh, this being one of them. We'll start with this, shall we? Assuming it plays. Uh, Herb Deutsch, uh, who got a look at the new Moog, at uh, Moog. This is it in prototype form, obviously. Um, just the bare bones, no box. Well, hi. I'm, I'm discovering a new instrument here. Um, I'm Herb Deutsch, and uh, my years of working with new synthesizers were many, but they were many years ago. And it's very, it's been very exciting to see a new instrument in this form in front of me, and it's, I, I, I'm ha- absolutely having a wonderful time discovering it. I'm not going to go into too much detail, about it, but first of all, I want to say I want Herb Deutsch to be my granddad. He seems like one of the nicest sort of blokes, and you know, seeing, I don't know, he looks like he's probably late sixties, early seventies, possibly a bit older, and he's playing. Bass lines on a Moog. That's just awesome. What an awesome guy. He just seems really yeah. But yes, that's the Moog sub fatty. Um, he's too thin to be your granddad. Hey, cheeky. I can I can kick people out of the chat room. You know, <laughs> I have administrative rights. <laughs> just watch your step. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Moog sub fatty, which looks kind of like it's a mini Moog kind of format, isn't it? You know, it's got the tilt top and uh, looks like a couple of oscillators and an extra drive on the filter. Uh, I don't know about the range and what have you, because I mean, obviously with the Minotaur, uh, they 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 limited the range partly because they wanted to keep it um, together with the, mini, the 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 Taurus pedals, but also because they'd have had to put a much bigger and more highly specified power supply in it because the voltages would have gone much higher further up the range, and to get them that stable would have made the electronics got a lot more expensive. But nonetheless, Moog Sub Fatty, Dave Spears, you're a safe Go. guy. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, have you played with any of the new Moog stuff? 
Do you know, not for a while is the honest answer. Um, I did try the Taurus pedals out at NAMM. They were, they were neat. Uh, this looks good, and I do like this variable drive business. They, well, they call it multi-drive. Multi-drive, that's right. Which is obviously, what's that, a kind of post and pre-filter? Absolutely drive. no idea yet, but um, hopefully we're going to get the opportunity to see it. Uh, Moog have told us that we're actually getting the world exclusive video to it apparently so okay. i've just i've just got to get to the in somehow into the hall <laughs> before I the show thought, starts I, I thought it was a kit one first of all you know when i saw the it was last week wasn't it when we were yeah. on the show it kind of got leaked and uh, or released and so i went straight and had a look at it and was like wow it's like reminded me of those kind of roland amdeck kits that they did years and years ago and i was like wow wow that would be really neat and then i realized it wasn't um, but yeah, no, I think with the, uh, it'll be interesting to see with the multi-drive, kind of tempted, depends on price, but the multi-drive, the, the gain, you know, the gain structure and stuff is really kind of important on a synth. It'd you know, be interesting to see if you can actually drive it less than a mode ordinarily has as well. Because one thing you notice when when I checked out the, uh, the Minotaur, I was really conscious of how hard the filter was driven, even though it was... You know, not, not there was no drive knob on it, so it'd be nice. If you, what would it be like if you could actually turn the drive down so you don't get that filter distorting? What that would sound like? It's really interesting. It does have a massive difference. Uh, I don't want to go on about us, but with the Imp Two, you know, in the Imp, you can change the filter drive effectively. So that instead of on the original, there was a kind of convoluted way of doing it, but we obviously just went for a knob. And actually, when you back it off. It sounds radically different, and in, and that's, in my opinion, the secret as to how you can make a good facsimile of another synth. You know, the, the, the amount of drive into the filter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, by all accounts, don't quote me on this. In fact, well, yeah, you, you're going to, but um, <laughs> you'll quote I yourself. I think it was a miscalculation on some of the Moog stuff that actually ended up giving it that particular sound. Ah, oh, that's an interesting idea. A happy accident. Yeah, yeah, that kind absolutely. of thing. Um, Gaz, um, do you own any Moogs? Would this tempt you into having one if it was uh, the price was right? Funnily enough, I was saying to someone today that I really that Animoog, oh sorry, Animoog, <gasps> uh, is uh, it makes me feel. I think it's such an absolutely wonderful synthesizer that it makes me feel like I actually do genuinely own one, and I've always wanted one. Never owned a. The only Moog thing I've ever owned is an expression pedal that is the most flimsiest, rubbish piece of plastic. It, it shouldn't have put the name on it because I always think of Moog chunky. Anyway, um, this synthesizer, though, yeah, I'm very interested in it. Um, I'm also thinking... That... Oh, and it's got noise as well, which is they make a big deal of that later in the video. He said, check out how great the noise is. The noise is great because it's not there or anything else. So is it called Sub Fatty then? Do you think that... that... Do you think, is that the actual name it's going to be? I have no idea. There's no official uh, word, I don't think. Uh, that, or maybe there is. That's a clue, though, isn't it, as to, as to like, it's a cheaper synth than the little patty, do you think? Well, it's got a keyboard on it, so, hmm. you know, I mean, it, it, even though it is mini keys by the looks of things, wasn't it? Or at least on that prototype, I guess. It could be a more expensive one, because they could have added a sub-oscillator, so then that makes it more. Aha, mm. uh -huh. of course. Maybe the other way around. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. So, uh, does anybody have a get uh, have a guess? I know Mark, you're not um, you, you're not much of a synth owner these days. No. More of a, a a modifier and what have you. Would would this would this tempt you? I mean, are you tempted? You kind of feel like you should own a Moog. Um, you know what? I I've I'm always really confused by Moogs, and that is uh, the first time because I grew up on Roland micro composers, the MC two hundred two and the SH one hundred one. So the first time I laid hands on a Moog, I was turning the knobs around thinking, it just doesn't seem to do anything. And it's a whole different experience, isn't it? It's a lot more subtle. So it's about yeah. subtle crafting of sounds. And then to get that fatness, you don't kind of wind a knob around and expect to hear a big change. You only hear kind of little ones. Now, I've got a very good software emulation of a Moog by a company not very far away from this podcast actually <laughs> <laughs> so and that works in roughly the same way and you know if i want those sounds they're kind of there so right. i'll tell you what i do I, what i do want though i want herb deutsch's personality yeah it when seems i like... wake up in the morning feeling miserable and mark which is you know just what i'm wandering around with i got a kind of that man's passion was just do you know how old he is i looked him up no no 
80. No 80 years way, old. man, really. That's fantastic. So he it's could like, be my grandpa. He's like a sprightly sort of mid-60s kind of guy, isn't it? And that's the that's his passion for what he's doing there, like kind of shining through. I just, just, he I seemed mean, genuinely des- delighted to be, have his hands oh, he on it, didn't he? He really it? did, yeah. Can I, and, you know, can... And, and it seems from his Wikipedia page that he's been around the Moog since its inception. So if he's saying that the oscillators are more in tune and it's got a better sound than the earlier ones, etc., etc., etc. I mean, if we if we guess that his ears haven't, I was going to say, I'm not sure I trust his ear. His ear. I wouldn't want him yeah, to. I wouldn't I, want him to do my mixy. I don't know. I, experience sometimes counts for a lot. I mean, maybe this is like you know the ultimate moog, and we should all be checking yeah, it out. Maybe so. Gaz, you were coming in there. Just about vibrancy of old of old people, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, seeing Ernest Ranglin, the guitarist, playing in Fuji Rock Festival last year was absolutely astonishing. You know, he was just he was jumping around the stage, and the thing that was really amazing was he was just doing an impro gig as well, and he was doing all this really interesting guitar. He was playing right at the top, right sort of right up by the bridge, almost just at, just at the pickups, and he was doing this thing, and some of it wasn't coming off. And he was making these really funny comical faces, but then when he found the right thing, he was like, "Yeah, man, I'm there, I'm there with it!" Like, and everybody was like, uh, <laughs> "This incredible!" Ah, oh, his energy was absolutely amazing, and yeah, yeah. But he, but of course, I was watching him. I know, sorry, this is total tangent, but he is the guy who invented the upstroke. You know, he played a my girl log the skank, he, as it were. He, he invented he invented the skank. So just as a musical innovator. You know that's absolutely gigantic, isn't it? It, that you is. know. it's a ter- it's a terrible shame that skank has become such an unpleasant word these days. When in fact it used to <laughs> yeah. mean sort of kind of rude boy dancing, and now it's sort of um, some stinky some trainers, stinky trainers, and sort of yeah, yeah, some somebody who's perhaps into crack or something. It's not. It doesn't quite have the same allure. But yes, mm. Ernest Wrangley. Ernest Wrangley, right? We'll have to check him out. Well, anyway, um, any guesses? What do we think? How much do you, how much do you think it's going to go for? Oh, blimey. Six hundred, six hundred pounds. Bucks. Six hundred quid. Yeah. I was going to go at seven ninety nine dollars, but that's. Uh, I was going to be. I, I was thinking closer to nine. Nine hundred dollars. Yeah. How much is a Voyager? Seventeen hundred quid. Eighteen hundred quid. I don't know. Yeah, quite. Two thousand two hundred dollars. Is it or yeah. something? A few quid. It's got to be about. It was, yeah, maybe somewhere around half that. It'll be interesting to see, won't it? Synth Beast guests in the chat room, I guess $1,400. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, this will be here in perpetuity, assuming there's no technical problems, so we can check back and see how um, how we're going to, well, see whether we got it right. But, uh, yeah, that's fun. Nice bit of fun. Um, so that's the first of our Nam Uh The other thing that we've got is, ah, oh, Ableton Push we're going to see there. That's good. And I saw a couple of things, actually. They released a couple of videos at the end of the year, um, which kind of showed programming beats and playing uh, chord stuff on it. I, I wanted to play one of those because it was it really... Well, I'll play you it. With Push, we've developed a new way of representing musical pitches using the pad grid. Scales and chords are easy to play and transpose if you know a few simple shapes. Let's look at how we play chords and melody on Push. We'll press the Add Track button to select a new instrument. As soon as you load an instrument, Push configures the grid to play notes. By default, each pad now represents a note in the key of C major. To help you find the root key, the blue pads are the Cs, while the white pads are the other notes in the scale. In this setup, you can play a scale across a row. But it's even easier to play three notes in a row and then move up. This is cool. You can see that some notes... I, I won't play the whole thing, but I recommend watching it. And I know I've been very sceptical about it. I don't want to learn how to program things, play a new instrument on squares. It makes no sense to me. But that video really made me think, you know what? I'm really kind of looking forward to getting my hands on this. I think this is going to be quite a bit of a change. I know Gaz is gagging to get I am. This is something I've been exploring for years now, you see. So seeing it in a commercial product... Is uh, it's going to be massive? I think that aspect. You know, I've been playing around with that for a while. I mean, you, you might have seen my Cuneo videos of other things that I've done. So, I'm having played around with those kind of ideas, not as I mean, this is such a nice implementation of that as well. I think it really. 
what I'm excited about is that a lot of people who've got into electronic music, like DJs and the like, who are like kind of non-musicians, they've created this incredible music, you know, and, and it's partly incredible because they've approached it from this non-musician thing. But those techniques that they've used was largely to do with samples and not actually playing in parts or playing in relatively less part parts. So I think that there's a whole bunch of people... Uh, they're ready for this, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I, and I'm ready for it as well, to be honest. And when we look at the kind of people who are amazing finger drummers, like Jeremy Ellis, you know. Now, Jeremy Ellis is a classical pianist, isn't he? Imagine, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, imagine combining all of those kind of skills, and it's just like there's going to be some absolutely pow music, you know, pow performance, live performance. So, Nick, when you get your hands on the push, I've got a few things I'd like you to check for me. Okay. You know, Things that you'd normally go for anyway. But, I mean, thinking about it as a live instrument performing on stage, you know, just how nice are those knobs to turn? Are they kind of, you know, all of this stuff needs to be... How tactile, is it? Yeah. Tactile. What are them pads like musically? You know, how easy is it to sort... You know, does it feel like they're too tightly packed? You know, do, do, you, do you feel like the kind of, um, you know, that it feels nice under your fingers? And also, probably most importantly... How sensitive are they? What I would want them to be able to be is so I can just barely, so I just literally can just touch them and it'll trigger the most gentle sample. Yeah, that's the the, the number of steps. Well, I, to be honest, I was I did get a call um, earlier this, well, late last week, of a possibility of going out and seeing it in the flesh somewhere near Bath, uh, a presentation, and uh, I'm hoping I might get a preview of it tomorrow afternoon. It may not come off. But if it does, I might have something pre nam to show. But otherwise, we'll be there. We'll go. I've got an appointment to see it in the flesh with uh, with the Ableton guys in some hotel somewhere, I think. But it does seem quite interesting. Uh, Dave Spears, I mean, you know, do, do you are you getting excited about this? I mean, did you watch? I don't know if you get a chance to watch those videos because I didn't send them in the links. But I did actually just um, happen to notice them when I was doing a bit of research for the show, and I just thought, oh, you know what? And the drumming one was really cool because you can zone the screen out into. Um, there's like a block of uh, pads, then there's a block of steps, then there's a step sequencer across the top. So for in terms of programming beats, it's really sort of multifunctional service and surface, and that that looked kind of really interesting to me. Yeah, I'm not a big Ableton user. It's, I mean, obviously we use it for testing and stuff like that. But like Gaz, I've kind of been into all of this alternative controller. But and again, exactly like Gaz, it's all down to the feel and sensitivity of it. And the, I'd say probably above and beyond programming capabilities in some yeah. ways. But what you will get with Ableton is a huge user base of people. Like you, you were saying about you know you don't want to program various bits and pieces, but you'll get a huge user base of people you know submitting patches. And yeah, whatnot. I mean it looked. It just looks like. The integration has been very nicely thought out to me. Uh, the more I see of it, the more I'm thinking, you know, I, I actually, because normally my first reaction is, yeah, I can't be bothered. But it looking at this, really there well are so made. there are so many dedicated knobs for this and buttons. It's like add new track and do this kind of stuff that I can see it being very tightly integrated and it could make Ableton a much more obvious choice for me. Uh, the one thing I did wonder about, though, Nick, is that, like, you know, Ableton is always very concerned about its, uh, you know, appearance everything in it's all super super slick appearance isn't it everything their websites their, the software itself it's all and like the push rather than say like the M, the mpc 40 before it this is very much kind of got this kind of very slick you know berlin kind of stylish thing going on with it you know uh but i wondered it looked like the text on the buttons might be all a bit small or a bit dark and obviously a lot of dark environments like kind of clubs and stuff where this thing could be used. That I might... think there's a backlit element to all of that, but yeah, that's that's a good point. It's just something I'll have to I'll have to check and test, I think. Um I'll ask them if they can turn the lights off perhaps when I do the video <laughs> and we can I, see. I, I was just won wondering if the style aspect kind of would, you know, be a negative thing in some ways. Mm, I don't know. Because it does look stylish. It does. I know, Mark. Um, do you get in, get in any of it? Because we've talked about the, we have talked about push before, and we've talked about the controllers. But it's just these videos are starting to make me convert me a little bit more to alternative ways of putting inputting notes. And it looks like they've kind of thought about it to make it more um, accessible to people like me who are perhaps used to a keyboard and want to kind of think about a transition. Um, I still like the one with the little hexagons on it, which I can't afford. Right. Which I know there's an eye app for, because it makes sense to me. Because the, you, when you look at it from 
different angles. There's there's several different angles that can happen away from an, a hexagon, and they all go up in musically relevant. If I go across at thirty degrees across that keyboard, it goes up in a musically relevant right. way. And if I yeah, exactly oh, yeah. that thing. Is, uh, so I can that? literally oh, I can step across that at oh, thirty degrees, it. sixty Hold degrees. Out, guys. 45 degrees or 90 degrees and each time each one of those angles does something different and musically relevant yeah that's the thing and it's incredibly clever because music's based around 12 notes and a hexagon has six sides so it all makes perfect sense yeah. to put it in a square with eight blocks across kind of right that well, doesn't make uh, sense to me i mean i uh, suppose it's whole note sense but it doesn't make sense when we're we're dividing music it's divided into 12 isn't it so um, okay. I don't know. I'd have to play with it and see how quickly I adapted to it. I mm. suppose that's always the the uh, uh, what's the word litmus test. Yes, that's nice. I haven't heard that for a while. I like <laughs> yeah. I'm liking the scientific ref reference. Uh, I, in fact, uh, did anyone see the um, the uh, periodic table joke that uh, failed Muso retweeted the other day? It was uh, oh. what was it? Oh God! It magnesium and oxygen are going out, and it's like OMG. <laughs> <laughs> periodic table joke there we go oh, sorry that's terrible okay. perhaps this time I, I, if I cover my shame I'm with an ad maybe that would be a good idea maybe that's what I'm going to do so I want to say thanks to our sponsors obviously Yamaha um, show sponsors here and uh, what you can see here is um, a selection of applications they basically have over 20 apps um, certainly more than that when this ad was uh, since this ad has been made we've got performance and play keyboard app and drum app uh, this for iPad apps uh, that you're seeing here uh, this is a great way of controlling MIDI data there's a new version which has got a built in synth at the moment which is well worth it uh, all sorts of ways of performing and playing adding faders XY pads and things to your MIDI rig so you can send out MIDI controller data and group all sorts of data together you We've also got ways of uh, editing and controlling your Yamaha synthesizers. Uh, you can use them with the Mo Motif XF, Mox, S90X, S70XS, Motif XS, and Rack XS. You've got voice edit control and multi edit control for accessing the different setups with the effect sends and uh, EQs and balances and all of that kind of stuff. So, very handy if your synth has maybe got a smaller screen, you can get your hands in and start to see a lot more information there. And uh, of course, this is the set list organizer, which I always go on about if you've seen this show before um, it's a way of sending MIDI data and notes for different sections in a song very easy visual way for sending out program changes and bank changes record and share cloud audio recorder lots of them basically if you want to see what Yamaha apps have got to offer head over to the app store and look up Yamaha apps it's a, it's a world of music uh, uk.yamaha.com and once again we thank Yamaha for their continued sponsorship of the show right there is um, another rumour which is I've done something very clever before you move on oh okay go on then Look, I've brought out my Yamaha. I just bought oh. this off eBay. Oh. A Yamaha MIDI controller. That's oh, fantastic. That's with lovely. little keys on it. I've seen those, yeah. we. Um, so I remember seeing Yamaha that when they released it at NAMM, and I thought it was a really cool idea, but it wasn't as nicely made as that. That looks like a slightly more sort of fancy version. It's the electric version. guitar version that's got a wooden body. Oh, I want it. The pro version. Oh, that's Which, cool. It's, because I can play the guitar. I can't really play the keyboard anywhere near as well. So, And this works, I think, as well as any other MIDI guitar. The problem with MIDI guitars is you try and play them like a guitar, and they're not guitars. Whereas this, this isn't a guitar. This is a MIDI controller that, ha that has a guitar-style input, and then you end up playing it like a MIDI controller that has a guitar-style input, and then you get really good results. Because it doesn't, it, I don't psychologically feel like it's a guitar. I Is it the one? It's got, um, it's actually got six little strings that you twang and then. It's got each... six little strings there that yeah. you tra twang, except they're not strings, they're like little coat hangers. <laughs> and then at this end, you've it's got, got. Oh, yeah, they've got a button for every note. Buttons, so yeah. it's got a full octave on each string. And each one of those virtual strings is on a different MIDI channel. So you've got 72 buttons that you can put samples on. If I just press press a key down, it plays it at low velocity. And if I pluck the string, it plays it at high velocity. And if I touch the string, it stops. And oh, I that's neat. It. How much did you get it for? The sampler and tried various different things with it. It's actually quite cool. It's quite controllable. How much did you get it for? If you don't mind me asking. £100. 
that's a bargain. I I, I, I like I, the look of those. I, I, I think mean, you're what, go, there's going to be envy. Yeah. We're going to have a rush on uh, no, Yamaha. I'm on, Easy. No, I'm on eBay now. <laughs> <laughs> See if you can make a live purchase, Gaz. Go on, I did one. <laughs> and then you can sell it to Dave as well. <laughs> so so my advice is to buy the electric guitar and not the acoustic guitar controller because the acoustic guitar doesn't have as many features. So if you can get the uh, Yamaha EZ-EG, that's the better one. I, I used the AG one on yeah. the project. Um, uh, somebody got in touch with me once. They wanted to make transcriptions for, for their... Uh, they were a great um, finger, pick, finger pick player. Uh, and it's just obviously very long-winded to sort of write out the transcriptions. So we looked at all the different uh, MIDI options at the time. We had one of those little Roland GI boxes um, and a few other things. But it was the Yamaha version of that with the buttons and the the, the strings there that was yeah. far and away the best way for making the tran for making the transcriptions because then it just kind of came out as a notation. Oh, neat. Played it in, yeah. Mm. Neat. Uh, well, yeah, thanks. I mean, this does all sorts of alternative tunings as well. So it does open G, open D, um, bar, E bar chord, drop D. And you can just flick to these different tunings straight away, and it's all because it's all in tune. If well, I th doing that's that neat. I tell you, the um, over there, which you can see back there, that's the Line Six JTV oh, yeah. 59S, which we've just had in for review, and that is really nice. I have to say, it's it sounds wonderful. Has um, it got fairy acts in it? It's the full Monty, yeah. Uh, but it's a really nice guitar as well. We just had Murph finish reviewing it. I'm going to try and get it online before uh, Nam, but uh, he was really blown away by it. I'm really impressed. Very nice guitar, you know, outside of all the electronics. It's a, just a quality instrument. So, but uh, yeah. Well, they're uh, we made by a proper luthier now, aren't they? Because they don't, they, I've got one of the Chinese ones, the really yeah, me too. cheap Line 6 thing that was about £200, which is great. It sounds really good and it's playable, but I know that Line Six stopped doing that, and, and they get they've got a top American luthier making James it. Tyler, yeah, that guy, yes, yeah, it's very good. Anyway, um, but we stop, we digress. Should, should we just have another Nam rumor? I think it's time we did. Um, let me see. <laughs> yes. I think uh, I have one here ready lined up, which I might have to just fast forward to get to the right bit. <laughs> Now, this is uh, obviously not what it is, but this is the IMS-20 with an MS-20 controller. And there is a rumour um, around at the moment that they're making one of these for real. So it will have, I mean, it will have that fu that format and perhaps be just, you know, the model inside or the electronics inside that will make it like a teeny tiny little MS-20, which I think would be absolutely cool and awesome. But I wonder whether that's actually the case. It's a little bit too retro, even for Korg, perhaps. But... Uh, I don't know what do you think. I've heard this rumor from a couple of people. Nobody's. Uh, I haven't. Korg haven't sent me any kind of like. Don't talk about anything. And I haven't heard anything officially at all. Actually, so this is pure conjecture. But it'd be pretty cool. Was it a cool idea for a starters? I mean, Dave, would you? I mean, have you? Have you you've got an MS10, right? No, twenty. You've got an MS20. Yeah. Would you? It would be kind of pretty cool to have this sort of thing available. I mean, I'm guessing it would have to be at some sort. Of, I mean, it's still going to cost quite a lot to make because it's got so many knobs and plugs and what have you in it. So, I don't know if they could get this out for six or seven hundred, six hundred, seven hundred quid. It would be pretty awesome, right? Yeah, if it, if it know, indeed exists, of course. Yeah, we had this discussion the other day. I looked at getting an eight oh eight. I know it's Roland, but have you seen the prices? Of 808. They're just You're so rare. Two and a half thousand quid. Yeah. Wow. We were like, why don't companies, you know, when you, we talked about that uh, TT303, you know, why don't companies reissue this, some of these things? I mean, making a 909 or an 808 really can't be that difficult. No. And likewise, you know, a, a, a little MS20 would be lovely, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be, have the same kind of uh, build quality i mean i've got an ms20 and it's built like a bloody tank isn't it i mean it's just you you could drop it a few times and it would probably survive that whereas i don't i don't suppose a legacy controller would survive quite so long but it'd be pretty cool what Very do you reckon cool. what do you reckon people would pay for one of those but if it was based on a legacy controller say what a hardware so a legacy controller with internal guts that made a noise yeah 700 quid hmm, interesting interesting idea you hear that, Korg? 
I want to see it. You've got till next week to come up with that. <laughs> so I'll be I'll be straight round. I don't know, Gaz. What do you think? Do you think this is likely, or do you think it's going to be just a polytron or something like that? Well, polytron. I mean, if they don't pull out a polytron, I will eat my monotron live on Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to say that? Um. <laughs> You'd have to blend it, perhaps, and drink parts of it. I think, really, that's not all. I, I, I could just advise caution there. Oh, okay. Um, you could chew on a corner of it. That would be lick, acceptable. Lick it all over. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I don't think the chat room's going to let you get away with it now It's now you've actually said this. <laughs> you've had it, man. Yeah. You, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> so you think a polytron, right? Yep. <laughs> Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Lick my battery. Right, what's the show title? Somebody, about their branding. Like... So they had a Triton, didn't they, before? Mm. So they've had the Monotron, the Triton. <laughs> so, so they have to have a, a Quadratron. That's what I reckon it'll be, a Quadratron. But it'll also have some of that XY pad technology built into it from the Chaos pad and the chaosolator so you'll have a chaos pa pad six built yeah. in or seven or eight a chaos pad 20 quadratron that's what it's going to be i know monopolytron <laughs> <laughs> you know but but seriously i mean Korg have been looking at this absolute the smallest part you know the the the, 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 the cheapest part of the whole analog synth market haven't they yeah yeah, we you know with like you know the cheapest analog synth you could possibly buy in the monotron. So, how difficult would it be to make a polyphonic monotron? You know, eight monotrons or even four monotrons to play. How difficult would that be? Um, I can't imagine it would. I mean, I'm sure people have probably could you know you could hack one. So a four voice poly synth for two hundred pounds. Oh, I think it'd be more than that. Because a monotron, well, a, po a monotribe. The monotrons are about 50 quid, though, aren't they? Yeah. But you'd need, a you'd need a keyboard that was meaningful. You'd have to put a keyboard on it, which would make okay. the case and the price an awful lot more. Yeah. Okay. 250 quid. A Korg what? tranny pole. <laughs> 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 Someone's just put, that was CR78 in the chat room. Good call. If you think about it, what's more likely is they've been slowly working their way through forward through time from the ms20 etc right in software haven't they yeah so we've had the poly 800 so what they're going to do next is they're going to release a korg m1 iapp which will not blow us all away <laughs> <laughs> um haven't they already done that oh i don't know i mean i'm just, just I'm like this, going yeah. along the timeline what would be after like the poly 800 what what well they haven't done the monopoly yet and I, they need to do that and then, well, that's probably it then, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go back. It was ASIO, apparently. Yes, 3200s. In the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's have a 3200. That would be a... Now, yeah, if we're going to get... If we get, we're getting excited there, cool. a PS3200. A PS yes, please. Fully polyphonic <laughs> analog synthesizer for 200 crown. 200 pounds. Okay. Easy PT, peasy, right? Yeah. Yeah. PT3200. Yeah, easy. For 250 quid. Thank you. Yeah, let's have that. I don't know, but yeah, it'd be great, wouldn't it? I mean, Korg usually bring out cool stuff at NAMM. You know, last year it was uh, the mini um, Chaos Elator and Chaos Pad, what's it? And then the new Monotrons after that. Or was it just before or just, I forget. They The monotr the new Monotrons, I think they brought, the Duo and the Delay, I think they brought out around Mesa time, I think. I could be wrong. I often am. But um, I'm expecting something, and Korg have said, yes, there will be something, but they haven't told us what it is. So... We've got bets on a Polytron or an MS an MS twenty um, mini version. So yeah, that'd be absolutely great. Uh, certainly not, you know, a tuner in pink, please. Although they'll probably release that as well, but perhaps not exclusively. So uh, yeah, that's the Korg rumor. Um, what else have we got? Um, there's been well, I've I've heard that there's going to be something else from Casio, presumably in the XW range. So I, I'm hoping to get something uh, through on that as soon as I can. But the other one was. Um, the uh, Avid seem to have been... Uh, uh, there's a NAM rumours on gear slurts. There's lots of these threads all over the place, which are... Uh, th uh, this one, you probably can't see. This is uh, gear slurts. There's a thread here called uh, Winter NAM and NAM Avid rumours. 
and uh, that there's going to be something big. I've heard products that are big. Uh, um, Pass more says I've heard rumours a big avid new product announcement at Nam is January. Uh, is it in January for two, two from two different people now? I wonder what it could be. And there's all sorts of speculation whether it's going to be Pro Tools 11 or 64 bit or any of the above. Because obviously, you know, the thing about Avid is there's been quite a lot of um, uh, well, you know, ups and downs. Most of the news that we've had over recent months has just purely really been to do with uh, corporate restructuring and loss of share price, really more than anything else, and jettisoning of of the the lower kind of price brands. So it'll be interesting to see what they're coming up with. I uh, know Dave Spears. Have you got any uh, any 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 thoughts on what it could be? No, none. <laughs> Which means you know, but you can't say. No, 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 no. I have none, and I, I I've kind of kept away from it. Yeah, no, I've sort of lost interest in that side of things. We were, are obviously being asked to support AAX constantly, uh, generally by people who work inside of Avid, but uh, as yet we are not going to. Right. It sounds like um, it sounds like there's there's going to be uh, there's all sorts of rumours. Uh, one one particularly good line I thought was uh, more likely to be Chapter Eleven than Pro Tools Eleven, which I thought was a good uh, quite a good gag there. But uh, obviously there's no truth in that. But a nice line nonetheless. Um, I'm sure that's not the case. But um, I'm, I mean I'm not really a Pro Tools user, but there are there's a huge ecosystem out there of people that ask. Particularly now there's native support and this sort of whole kind of flim flam between the AAX format plugin and you you know uh, it's it's proved kind of confusing so I mean some clarity would probably be a good idea I mean Gaz this doesn't really affect you does it because you're not a tools user or do you have to deal with kind of transition of projects no I have to yeah but I'm yeah um yeah I'm just still smarting at Avid for hurting Sibelius you know I just that was such a great company Right. Well, I mean, I, I guess in any scenario, I mean, at the moment, there are people making all sorts of horrible decisions financially. Yep. You know, where I, I was just in the street the other day, um, the, 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 the sort of brand new sort of shopping centre down the bottom of town. We've lost Jessup's HMV and administration. And there was another shop which just Comet. sold Comet. Comet you know, we're Blockbuster the, the, gone there today. Like Blockbuster, yeah. Blockbuster today, are they? Yeah. Jesus. Yep. That's I like, knew that would happen. I've been uh, waiting for that for months because... You know what? It's a whole other conversation. It That's is, but that. I mean, the the thing is, is all obviously everything is changing enormously. So I mean, that's. I mean, part, well, the the most important part of that conversation is that Google have got all the money. Well, what Amazon happens, actually. All, all the high street, all the high street retailers went. We need to get our share of the internet market because the internet people are, are making all the money, and so they've put masses of advertising into things like Google. It hasn't given them any more returns and and they've had too many outgoings and not enough incomings i suppose so you know they forget that half the world still doesn't use the internet there's a whole load of 60 70 okay. 80 year old people walking around who buy washing machines and fridges and stuff who've never seen a computer in their life and so they i think that our high street stores and our internet based stores need to sort of separate go their separate ways and stop giving all their money to google for advertising because i don't think it makes any difference there you well, go yeah well that's an interesting that's th interesting on. thought uh i mean i think um amazon are kind of really cleaning up i mean that's that's what sort of tends somebody to... some i think it was failed muso today put a fantastic post on facebook and it was uh in Jessup's, which actually didn't go down because it was insolvent, it went down because the suppliers changed the credit terms overnight in light of Comet. So uh, it's not what it appeared. No, it anyway, in the window was a picture and it said, We're closed, go to Amazon uh, for all your purchases. What was it? Um, avoiding paying tax 1% at a time. Yeah. <laughs> which was a great scout sense of humor. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, that's a whole uh, another discussion. But yeah, I mean, what would you like to see? Let's say, I mean, because uh, Mark, you you use Pro Tools, don't you? Kind of, it's, it's I something... do use Pro Tools, but I've stopped on version eight, and I've got no reason to go further any for, forward any further at the moment because the main studio that I work with has stopped on version seven. So we're quite happily exchanging sessions. And then I tend to just pull everything out of stems and put it in Logic to work anyway now because I've sort of. 
Uh, it falls over a lot, Pro Tools, on my system. Maybe because I'm on version 8 and I'm running it on Mountain Lion and you're not meant to. <laughs> yeah, well, that's quite possible. Um, uh, I see no need to buy it at the moment, though, because I don't know. I'm just enjoying working in Logic, and I know that's way behind. And now I can talk about the thing I was telling you with Mike Gregg. Uh, oh, the, yeah. night, the other night, Mike uh, contacted me and said, hey, I've been running cubase 7 i've been playing around with it i've been and there's this live window thing do you want to try doing a session over the internet so for about four hours we connected up via broadband and we were tracking guitars and vocals and stuff across the internet live from like me playing albeit very badly <laughs> into a session that he was recording in his house which is amazing i mean I and it worked that- okay it worked, yeah. That was what I mean. I sort of was thinking, yeah, this is never going to work. And uh, we had a few difficulties at first, but once we ironed those out, uh, and it did crash a couple of times. But once we ironed out, like what wasn't happening in terms of the latency, um, once we got that straight, then uh, he, I think he said he was hearing a, about a one and a half second delay from it coming to my house, encoding at my end, and going back to him. I know all the stuff was turning up in time enough there. Because it's all stamped, uh, When isn't it, it was so. out of time, I could always use the excuse like, oh, dear, something must have happened with the... <laughs> it's the wires, stuff. it's not it me. me playing out of time, honestly. <laughs> but I'd, I, I mean, interesting technology that they've got that working where I haven't really seen that working before. I mean, I've tried it with, what was that uh, plug-in th- system that we were using, E-Session. I tried that, and I didn't, couldn't really quite get that to work, but I wonder if that was my internet connection. So, I mean, all of these things, we need we need an inv- uh, uh, we need to invent a new MIDI so that all of these manufacturers all play into the same environment, and then I can work in Logic, you can work in... Uh, I don't know, Gaz can work in Pro Tools or whatever, and we can all... It's an interesting idea that perhaps, you know, the next big thing should be just remote session hookup because, you know, well, the transport costs and um, all that kind of stuff becoming so expensive, it's a lot easier. Gaz, you, I'm sure you must come in there because you've got um, a version of Cubase, haven't you? We sort of hooked you up there. Have you had a chance to play with those features? Uh, I'm, I've tried them a little bit. I just need somebody to try them with. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I was, you know, I'm wondering how uh, Omforce are doing with their, their like, uh, their multi-client sort of. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, it, it was, it was some great things going on there, but there were so many unfamiliar aspects and so many things that needed looking at to kind of bring it into line with ways that people are used to working. I'd imagine they're quite busy just. To keeping yeah. up with that, I mean, I don't know. It's not been in the news very much, so really ambitious say, so to make yeah. a completely new door, you know, to have you know to get people to actually have to learn a new paradigm to work within. Uh, the Cubase thing, though, is very nicely in, uh, integrated, and uh, there's a new thing called the Hub as well when you boot into Cubase Seven. So kind of, uh, there's all this kind of uh, social networking stuff built into it, should you want it. But I mean, it's interesting to see that they've that they're really trying to embrace this kind of thing. Because this is... Well, do, you know, do you know what I absolutely loved about it? I totally work in isolation. Ass- uh, <laughs> I'm an ass, I know, <laughs> oh. but I totally work in isolation. isolation. So, and I, don't, I just make music on my own now, and I don't talk to other humans, and I don't kind of interact, and I might send all the stems to someone, and then they'll change it, and then I get cross. But <laughs> what was really nice about it was seeing Mike's face on the screen chatting and bantering about what was happening and like and it made me play completely different things to what i would normally play and we ended up going in a totally different direction to the direction i'd go on my own and maybe it's not as good as being in a room with another human being in terms of like you can't punch someone when they get really out of line (laughs) i'm joking of course but um but there was something about like working with someone else it felt like working with someone else even though mm. there was a no, that's like, interesting. So uh, even delay. though it's remote, I mean, it's the same. We we experience it here because we communicate regularly as a group, and we understand the kind of timings and the, the the intricacies of the technology that allows us to do this. So we can kind of anticipate 
over talking or you know when when someone's going to make a noise do you see what i mean we, we've got we've learned that language and in terms of maybe having it in based in a door i think we're going to find that that's going to be happening in fact i think what we should perhaps do after nam is organize a session where we've all got a way to participate and we just document it and just see how it goes and maybe outline some of the problems that arise and what have you and that would be because uh, i think this is going to it's eventually going to happen isn't it gaz yeah, definitely. Can I tell you what I've been, what I'm working on at the moment, though, just to just to give you like a kind of uh, work in progress kind of report uh, briefly is uh, something within Cubase 7 uh, is quite an interesting way of working. And that's to play. Uh, I do a lot of jamming, freestyle jamming with bands and whatever. Um, record freestyle jam, total freestyle jam. You bring it into Cubase and then you can really excellently extract the tempo map automatically. And then you can straighten it, straighten everything that you did in the jam up, put, put all your parts on and everything, and then unstraighten it and go back to the original free form and everything that was... Oh, really? That, wow, that that's is cool. Really cool. Into the free form. Well, it's, it's straight a, loops oh, and everything dang. back into the free yeah. form. Yeah. If you drop, so if you drop loops in it or tempo change loops to follow what you played in the first place? Yes. That's really cool because that's yeah. what's kind of missing from electronic music with certain yeah. genres of music. I think that when I, you I'm, get everybody to play to a grid, yeah. it really kills something off. It completely and it, does. And yeah. what I'm doing at the moment, I'm finding such brilliant fun. I cannot express how much fun it is. It's just actually having machine, uh, the native instrument machine, uh, following my freestyle jam within Cubase. And the way that the, 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 the new Cubase kind of tempo map thing works is it does, it's loads of bars of 1-4. <laughs> so it just kind of okay. affects, it's just, uh, and then you can put temp, you can put like 4-4 four, four bars in on stuff if you want, which is useful to do. But when it, what's fantastic with it at 1-4, it means that even however the band is playing, the machine follows it beautifully and you just drop all your stuff in in, your, in, in like your step sequence and all this kind of stuff and it, and it's all locks in. It locks in. Wow, that is really quite revolutionary. That sounds very interesting. Dave, you're looking very thoughtful there. Is that kind of giving you some ideas? Uh... No, you were thinking about <laughs> something else completely. No, no, no. Gaz and I spoke about this on a journey a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's really fascinating, actually. It is. And like Mark said, it's exactly what's missing. To, to the idea to be able to just sort of jam in your kind of wonky way, then straighten it out and then re, un, unstraighten it again. That is an awesome idea. Yeah. Is that, is that peculiar to Cubase, Gaz? No, it's my idea, but ah. you, the, the Cubase's functions effectively allow you to do that. Ah, okay. So it's like, it's, it's like a working doctrine or method that you've kind of... Yeah. Of. That's a great it's, idea. It's a bit fiddly and there's quite a lot of stuff to go through, but, you know... I, I can see it working and I'm just thinking, oh, you know, yeah, wow. It can get, it can get complex. Yeah, I I've, can imagine. Uh, I think it was like six, uh, 14 tracks, uh, multi-track, you know. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's a, I mean, it's the, that is the question that musicians always ask the technical guys. It's like, yeah. the, can we get the drummer to kick, play a kick, and for all the sequences to follow it? And the answer's traditionally been, well, no, not really. The drummer's going to have to play to a click. Yeah. But, I mean, if, it's, if things are getting to the point where things can analyze what's coming in accurately enough that that might be a possibility, that could, and, and maybe not from the kick, maybe from some other... In, I'm I mean, sure that's been. I'm sure that's happened in the past, hasn't it? You've been able to drive clock off yeah. uh, off a trigger. I mean, it just depends on the Not music. Though. Depends I mean, on the. You like, used to be able to do it on the SRCAT, but it had to be. The, the great thing about this is, though, there is. What happens no if someone plays a double kick by mistake? Though the whole. Well, thing yes, is there is that as well. It has to have error, error tolerance and stuff. Sorry, Gaz. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, you know, the thing that I really like about this is, though, uh, just. Hard drives storage is really cheap. So if you're in a studio setup now, and you know, in fact, we were talking about that that Line Six desk. You know, you could just be there. Everyone could just be plugged into that, and it just captures it onto the SD card. Just it was just recording the whole session, and you just find that nice little moment there, and bang, drop it in, and you've got no compromise on the working methods, shall we say? I mean, engineers have forced musicians to work to click tracks, not because it's the best of the music, 
it's just because it's best for them for their editing and that is the truth yeah well that's because the technology is not true. yeah i mean it, it but it's down to budget isn't it it's like yeah i can do it that way but if you want to pay for me to how enormous that changes the music it's yeah, yeah, yeah. enormous yeah. so yeah. i love now that the technology has now kind of gone in the musician's favor now and that this is uh you know it's like yes but but all that kind of hip-hop stuff as well can completely work within it oh, it's beautiful i'm so into it it's great excellent well that sounds like a really uh, brilliant way of doing stuff and i'd love to uh to to see it in action at some point um i guess really uh, i haven't got any more nam rumors unless any of you lot have got anything you want to add because I've, I've run out really um we've we've kind of done it there doesn't seem to be quite as much as i'd um i'd like to i'd like to have had but maybe there will be some other um, stuff coming up, um, you know, well, obviously we'll be there at the show. We'll be doing our thing. You can follow us. Uh, all our stuff is going to be posted on YouTube. Um, so you should be able to see that. And um, the idea is that our, our um, CMS just grabs it and posts it online. And I've got all that working today with, with still with two days to go. So it's amazing, really. Um, and Andy's off to LA tomorrow. Uh, he's having a few days off. And then, uh, as I say, we're going to be there at the Personas booth on Thursday and Friday and Saturday mornings, quarter to 10 Pacific time, doing a little 15 minute roundup. And we should hopefully get a bit of uh, additional uh, footage. We're going to try and put some exclusive stuff in there. So if you want a kind of a flavor of uh, live Sonic State, um, head over to Presonus. And once again, we thank them for their sponsorship of our attending the show. It's really helped us out a lot and sort of meant that we can just kind of uh, not worry about a couple of things. So that's been great. Um, but I don't know. Anybody got any other rumors? I mean, now's the time to speak up because um, this is the last show before. I think there might be something from Spectra Sonics. I've been searching. Uh, I couldn't find anything um, about that. It's all that. gone very, very quiet. I think that's... Is that a sign? Yeah, yeah. As a developer, it's like you just go very, very quiet before you're about to do something. Because you're so busy. Yeah, exactly. I so I've it. been kind of like keeping a little eye on some of Eric's posts. You think there might be something from them? Well, that'd be interesting. It'd be nice. Yeah, it would. I mean, they've not released anything as big as um, uh, the... Um, God, what's the what was the... Synth, the Omnisphere. Omnisphere for a while so I mean that would be quite a challenge I mean, it must be quite a challenge to come up with something that would top that because that's obviously done very well for them but yeah I'm told there's st- well there is going to be stuff from Artoria um, but I'm not sure how thrilling it is at the moment um, there's going to be there's there's bound to be a bunch of other items and we've tr- what we've tried to do this year with the show is give ourselves some wonder time so we're not just stuck to appointments we've sort of not we're going to knock out some of the stuff that probably doesn't really require a video so that we can put stuff that would benefit from video in in its place i think you got anything to add to the nam rumor m- mill gaz um <laughs> no <laughs> no uh no sorry that's all right that's no problem well I think perhaps um, this might be a, a, a good... Oh, look. What's that? Phase 57 median jaw foot. What's that? Nick, check this out. More cutlery items from the... Uh... <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm just going to put this over here. We can have a look at this. This is uh, posted in the chat room by... Um... <laughs> Sonic 2381. Let's have a look if I can uh, get that. This is the... <laughs> That's very funny. This is the Aldi Jordan Rudess endorsing the washing machine, lawnmower, fertilizer, and uh, two sorts of cereal. Excellent. That's cracking. Did that. <laughs> that's, that's great. I can't get the whole thing on the screen, but uh, uh, brilliant. Nice, nice spot there. Is the cereal Jordan's milk? Because that just happens to be about. 200 yards down the road from me. No, but it should be. Uh, isn't there a Jordan's kind of um, muesli? Yes, yeah, Jordan's it should be. milk. It's not. It's, it's all brown and Weetabix. <laughs> that's they great. They make Weetabix as well, do they? Oh. <laughs> that's excellent. Thank you very much for that. That's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing if I can actually make that. I'm trying to get that so we can see it because I can't actually. Let's see if I can. Ah, that's the problem. It's gone all big. So if I do that. Then I should be able to. You might be able to see all of it. Really, it's something else. There we go. Now, if I do that, oh, that's not quite how I. There we go. Now you can see it. 
in its entirety. Aldi, uh, for those who perhaps don't know, is a sort of cheap supermarket brand that sort of they've got a current advertising campaign that's like brands only cheaper. And this is um, this is a mock-up of Jordan. Maybe Jordan is looking for a bit of maybe he's doing a European tour. That's very. It's funny. I'm sure he would chuckle himself. Anyway, guys, um, thank you ever so much for joining me. Um, I know that um, time is precious around Nam time, especially for developers and uh, this time of year generally. But uh, I will endeavour to um, bring you all the good cheer from California that I possibly can, assuming we don't get sick before we go. So I want to say thank you very much to uh, Dave Spears, G4 Software, for joining us. That's uh, been a great pleasure having you. No, thank you very much, and have fun. And uh, yes. Enjoy the margaritas without me. I will. Uh, although, uh, to be honest, I thought I booked a BA flight and I was just checking because I needed to see whether I had a, a power on the plane. And I was just looking and I noticed it's actually what they call code sharing. So I'm flying American Airlines, and I, but I've paid BA prices. Nice. Right. And anyway, yeah. thank you very much also, Gaz Williams, songsurgeon.co.uk, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of fun. Yeah, great fun as ever. And, of course, uh, Mr. Mark Tinley. Over there with his Yamaha guitar. What t- what's the name of that guitar again? It's an EZEG for the Americans or an EZEG for the English people. Yeah, it looks like a cracking, uh, a cracking. It's tool. really, really nice. It's a lovely little piece of technology. It's about ten years old. Yeah, I remember. It's yeah, that's the trick. Very, very good. Yeah, of course, um, uh, if you are at Nam and you're around on Saturday night, we generally hang about at the Marriott pool bar um, from about show end until i can't drink anymore which is not very long actually um because i'm not capable i'm not a very capable drinker i'm glad to say but a few margaritas will be had so if you fancy coming up and saying hi or you see us at the show just come up and say hi always nice to say hi as long as i'm obviously not in the middle of filming something that'll be um obviously um a bit tricky but please do come up and say hi and also um like we say saturday night be the time and also don't forget uh, watch us on personas if you go to personas.com there's details of where you can find the live stream uh they will be uh 9 45 pacific time um will be on and i expect they might repeat it throughout the day or maybe they won't depending on how it goes <laughs> we'll have to see because we've actually got no preparation it's going to be very free form but it should be fun so that's it uh, sonic talk number 207 98 gosh only two more to 300 can, I, can yes. I just address the chat room before you leave of course you made mark Tesco's is a supermarket chain, and yes, the British burger has been found to have 29% horse meat in it. You're right. But I really want to advocate eating horses because (laughs) I've got a thing about eating horses. I went to Slovenia to do some talks about autism, and when I was there, they said, oh, oh, you must have horse burger. It's really, you know, really great thing. And I, I was like, yeah, okay. So I went to the city centre, Ljubljana city centre, and there's a stand in the middle of the park called Horse Burger, and the it, the burgers are made of horse meat, and it's absolutely it just tastes unbelievable. It's like a cross between lamb and pheasant, I think mm, would be the best. Well, way there we to go. It. I, so, I I wouldn't want to. So have... I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't know why everybody's freaking out about it because it's actually really nice. I think the thing that they're freaking out about is the burgers in question uh, have actually no indication that they've got horse meat in them and they've just been discovered but that's probably a topic for another time in the meantime we'll say thank you very much to everybody for watching thanks to all in the chat room <laughs> and we'll see you uh, at nam you'll see all our new normal coverage just check the show sonicstate.com uh, there'll be headlines aplenty i'm sure so thank you very much for watching <laughs>